All right, uh, so let's get started. Thank you everyone for joining uh, and welcome to the Young Scholars webinar on climate finance and economics. My name is Ishita Sen and I will be your moderator today. Um, so, so far we had about four webinars in our series. Uh, we started with Tomas Tomanen from Boston College, followed by Ishan Nath from the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco and Daniel Green from Harvard. All really excellent presentations. Uh, and if you wanna watch those past webinars, there are recordings available, so please check out the eAccess Forum's website. Um, today, we have another excellent paper and a fantastic presenter lined up. So we are welcoming Professor Shange, uh, who will present her paper, The Costs of Hedging Disaster Risk and Home Prices in the Face of Climate Change. So Shan is an assistant professor of finance uh, at the Stern School of Business at New York University, and her research focuses on corporate finance and the insurance industry. Um, many of her papers study the economics of insurance industry and interactions with climate risk. Um, her works published in top finance journals quoted by the US Senate and featured in top news outlets such as the New York Times. Um, so before we, we start off the presentation um, uh, and hand over the floor to Sean, we have this short survey on the topic that we are discussing today. So Anushka, would you would you please launch the poll? So if you guys could just get started uh, and, and, and try answering this and then and we get started immediately after. All right, um, so Anushka, would we have? Yeah, so what happens to the prices of affected homes? 67% uh, of us thinks that it would go down. Um, and uh, will the effect be larger for homes exposed to sea level rise? Uh, yes, um, so, so great, so great start. Uh, with that, let me, without any further delays, uh, uh, let Sean take over. Uh, so Shan, the floor is all yours. Hey, thanks a lot, Ishida, and thank you everyone for showing up. Had I known this would be such a big crowd, I should have uh, clean, cleaned myself up better. Okay, so the title of the paper is The Cost of Hedging Disaster Risk and Home Prices in the Face of Climate Change. This is joint work with a PhD student at NYU, Emma Lam, and my co-author, Ryan Lewis, at University of Colorado Boulder. So why do we care about this topic? Uh, homeowners everywhere face risks of natural disasters. Many of those disasters will get worse or become more frequent due to climate change, for example, wildfires, storms, and floods. And uh, insurance is the main tool households have to hedge those risks. And flood risk is particularly important in the US. There are more than 15 million homes uh, that are exposed to flood risk. So that's more than 10% of the houses in the US. And households mitigate flood risk through flood insurance provided by the National Flood Insurance Program. So this is a government program and it's dominating the market. So it, it makes up more than 95% of the market. And this pricing, because it's a government program, it becomes our, a debate a policy issue. And there have been many attempts to reform the pricing. And the debates often surround home values. So the opponents to raising rates uh, often argue, well, this is going to depress home values and that's bad for people and we should not raise rates. However, a lot of, uh, from our conclusion, we're going to say, you know, when rates are too low, uh, home values will actually be overstated. And another reason why we care about house price is that it is the most, uh, usually it's a, the most significant component of a household's wealth. And because a house, Houses are long-lived assets. They also reflect the future expectations of, uh, in many, many years to come. 
So what are the specific research questions we ask? The motivating question we have in our mind is how do the cost of hedging disaster risks affect home values? And most specifically, uh, we ask two questions. The first is when flood insurance rates go up, how and how much do home prices change? And the second question we ask is, does aligning flood insurance rates with risks um, underlying uh, properties, will that accelerate climate risk being incorporated into home values? So what's our method? Uh, we use a uh, flood insurance rate reform that started in 2013. And premiums change discontinuously uh, according to flood zone boundaries. What do I mean? So in the US, uh, the government program basically designs the maps for where the flood risk is higher. So they have high risk zones and low risk zones. And uh, this reform says if a house is in the high flood zone, and if it was built uh, before, the, before the local flood map was introduced, then their rates are gonna go up the highest. So these house built prior to the creation of local flood insurance rate map, uh, what we call pre-map houses. And if they are also located in areas that are designated as high risk areas, then uh, they used to get the biggest subsidy. So the idea was that before the government introduced these flood maps, people build those houses there uh, in high risk zones and the government thought, well, they didn't know that they were building high risk zones, so we shouldn't penalize them in the flood rates. So we're gonna give them subsidized flood rates. However, the program was unsustainable because it was uh, very heavily in debt. Then the government said, okay, if then a lot of senators voted for this reform, they, they argue that with um, the rates being low for these households, the program will not be sustainable in the future. So they called for an increase for premiums. And they said, okay, premiums are gonna increase with a range of percentages and it will continue to increase in the future until it reaches a full risk rate. But they never define what full risk rates are. So that's uh, one of the challenges we face that I will talk about later. And in our regression design, we use triple difference uh, regression and we regress home transaction prices on this triple interaction term pre-map uh, times high risk times post reform. And we introduce a lot of granular fixed effects to try to get a clean estimate of the, um, of the causal effect of this flood insurance rate reform. Let me give you an overview of our results. We find that these pre-map high-risk homes that saw the largest increase in premiums, they also saw the largest decrease in home prices relative to all these other houses in our sample. And the effect is larger in states that mandate flood zone disclosure. So some states ask the sellers to, to, to tell the buyers whether the house is in a flood zone or not, and some states do not require that. And we find the fact is larger if there is mandate uh, for this disclosure. And we also find that the effect is larger if the homes, if if home uh, a home is exposed to sea level rise risk. And we argue that um, for the houses that are exposed to sea level rise risk, insurance rates potentially trigger people to update the costs associated with future risk. So on one hand. Uh, when people see the flood insurance rates go up, they may think, well, a, th these insurance rates will continue to increase in the future, which was what the reform said it's going to do. And they may also be thinking, well, now that flood insurance rates are more expensive, I really want to re evaluate how much flood insurance rate, uh, how much flood insurance coverage I want. So they assess their risk more uh, carefully. And this reevaluation may lead people to realize or they, they may update their actual flood risk exposure in the long term uh, that this, this um, sea level rise risk will not manifest until maybe 50 or 80 years later. And this is how 
th this is two of the channels. One is just purely through the cash flows of insurance rates, and the other is through the increase in the perception of the risk that cause house prices to go down more uh, for these houses that, that are exposed to sea level rise risk. So let me give you some institutional background. This uh, National Flood Insurance Program was created in the 1960s. It covers more than 50, uh, it covers 50 states and Puerto Rico. It underwrites 4.5 million flood policies per year, and it collects uh, $3.6 billion of premium per year and $1.4 trillion, uh, providing $1.4 trillion of coverage every year. And it uh, makes up more than 95% of the flood insurance market. And another important concept is this map, uh, flood insurance rate map. So these maps are at a community level. A loosely kind of overlaps with the with counties. And in each within each uh, location, there will be very granular. Uh, drawings of you know these this little area is high risk and this area is low risk. I'll show you some examples. And most maps were established between 1975 and 1990. So we call how a house to be pre-map house if it was built before the local map was drawn. And another important concept is uh, risk zones. So for our paper, what matters is high risk zone versus low risk zone. Even though within high risk zone, there are actually many different zones, but for the pricing purpose, those different zones all have the same price. And that's uh, this risk zones are defined by National Flood Insurance Program. A house is in a high risk zone if it has more than 1% chance of being inundated by a flood in any given year according to the definition of the uh, National Flood Insurance Program, not that this is the actual you know, uh, scientific uh, measure of the, uh, the risk of the house. And if a house is located in the high-risk area, then they are mandated to buy flood insurance uh, if the house also gets a mortgage that's federally backed. So these are the houses in our sample. We take all the houses that are transacted in Zillow, and then we overlay them with digital flood maps. So a lot of these great areas are places where we don't have digital flood maps. And these warmer colors, the red and purple, they are high-risk houses, and the uh, green and yellow are the low-risk houses. So as you can see, there are a lot of high-risk houses in Florida, and on the West Coast. Uh, but of course, they are also scattered uh, everywhere else uh, here, here. So let's zoom into a sample area. So this is the Tampa Bay area in Florida. And what we can see is that the houses are very, uh, so the high risk houses, there are a lot of them just, uh, just by the water, by the ocean. But even in inland areas, we also see high-risk houses. And another interesting thing is high-risk houses are also right next to some low-risk houses. So there's no, um, there's no huge gap between the two. And we also see the post-map houses uh, kind of merge together with pre-map houses. So there is also not kind of super well-defined uh, at least there are areas where they are merged together, even though uh, you can kind of see clusters where there are more pre-map houses versus post-map houses. Okay, so now let me tell you how the rates are set. Uh, first, the insurance rates are set by the risk zone, whether the house is in the high risk zone or low risk zone. And the second important thing is whether the house was built before a map was drawn, the local map was drawn. So whether the house was a pre-map house or post-map house. And a third, the third important thing is the elevation relative to potential flood death. So if a house is built very, very high, built on stilts, even if it's in a uh, high-risk zone, it may get low, uh, low, rating, uh, low rates. And uh, the important thing for our uh, identification is that the pre-map houses in high-risk zones they used to get a lot of subsidies prior to the reform. 
So what did the reform do? Um, so the reform was kind of motivated by the huge deficit uh, of this uh, national flood insurance program. This program was $18 billion in debt as of 2011. And this reform actually was made up of two uh, consecutive acts. So the first act was uh, passed in 2012, the Bigot Waters Act. And there was uh, a lot of provisions in the act and there was a lot of protests, uh, a lot of people calling their Congress, um, congressmen and congresswomen and complaining about certain provisions affecting them. And then the Congress then passed the second reform, the Homeowners and Flood Insurance Affordability Act in uh, 20, 2015. But the one thing that didn't really change is these high risk, uh, pre map high risk homes, they saw the largest increase in premiums. So the reforms gave a range for the increasing premiums, and that's between 5% to 25% annually. But how much rates change from year to year is still up to the National Flood Insurance Program to, to finally decide. So the reform emphasized that it's just trying to reduce the subsidies received by these, uh, these pre-MAP high-risk homes. It never said, oh, these homes are becoming riskier. However, it is possible when people get the shock of uh, rate increase, they may re reassess the risk and decide, oh, maybe the risk is higher than we thought. So this, this is how the rates changed. The, this first column of rates, they are for the high-risk pre-map homes. As you can see, the rates increased pretty dramatically from 2012 to, to uh, 2018. It went up by almost $600, and the annual percentage increase is around uh, 6%. And then among these other big category of houses that are high-risk and post-map houses, they, the rates are determined uh, based on the elevation of the house. So if the house is higher than the base flood uh, level by one foot, then the premiums are much lower than these uh, pre-map house rates. So they are just more than $600 to begin with and they increase for more than $100. And annual percentage increase is also small. And the rates are higher if the elevation is lower for houses in this category. So as you can see, if the elevation is below the flood elevation, then the rates are really, really high. However, these category actually didn't see increase. They actually saw decreases throughout a sample period. Uh, I guess the government probably was thinking, well, these houses were getting too high uh, premiums and that was unfair, so we need to reduce their rates. So another thing I want to mention is for these high-risk pre-map houses, if the elevation is actually high, then they would go into these categories. So they could apply for this, uh, this plus one elevation rate, which is much lower, or this zero elevation rate if they qualify. But households have to go get an elevation certificate, which costs thousands of dollars. So uh, that, that could... Um, prohibit some households to actually get the better rate, even though they might actually deserve this rate. And another category of houses are these low risk houses. And it doesn't matter whether they are uh, pre-map or post-map, their rates are usually much lower, much lower compared, to, compared to these two categories. And their rates also increase, but still uh, much smaller than this first category. So this first category of houses are those, uh, our kind of focal houses, our treatment houses. Let me, so this, this is a plot of the number of news articles with some keywords in Factivia. And basically this is trying to say before the reform, there was actually very little anticipation. There was no talk about uh, potential uh, of the upcoming reform. And then it kind of picked up after the rates actually started being implemented and people getting seeing the higher rates and there were a lot more news coverage until the second reform was passed in uh, 2014. So let me tell you a little bit of uh, 
uh, about our data. We use Zillow data from 2009 to 2018, and these are transaction data. So we use transaction prices. And we know a lot of things about the properties from real estate assessors. So we know the square footage, the number of bedrooms, and we know the exact location. So we can identify them on these flood maps and classify houses as high risk or low risk. And we also know their year built, so we can classify them as pre-map or post-map. So as I said earlier, even if a house was pre-map and high risk, if they were built on high elevation, they could classify themselves as post-map houses and get lower rates. So this variable, uh, pre-map variable is measured with noise, which should only work against us in finding um, the results that we would hypothesize. So this is our main regression. We look at how log of price is a function of this triple interaction term, high risk times pre-map times post-reform. And we also include uh, square footage as control, and we include zip by house age, uh, the property age as a uh, fixed effect. And we also include zip by location, by number of bedrooms, by year fixed effects. So this fixed effect absorbs a lot of the time trends that are specific to a specific location and specific to uh, large versus small houses in that location with this number of beds. So what do we mean by location? Uh, this location is latitude, longitude, rounded to two decimal places, and that's around uh, 0.8 miles uh, range. So it's a very small area. And we cluster our standard errors by uh, zip and uh, year by quarter. So this is our main result. We find that prices of homes went down uh, the most for these high-risk pre-map homes relative to the other homes in our sample. And this is consistent with premiums going up the most for high-risk pre-map houses. So in this, uh, let's see, the first column, we have more relaxed fixed effects. And in the second column, we include house fixed effects. And in the third column, we have this uh, very granular fixed effect, as I just explained. Our estimates are pretty uh, stable. We also want to see how the effects evolved over time. So here we do the same regression, but rather than using the post-reform dummy, we use a series of year dummies here and estimate how this uh, high-risk pre-map houses prices are different from our benchmark house prices uh, from year to year. And here we see the effect kind of kicking in in uh, 2013 and remains relatively stable over time. So that lines up with the timing of the reform. And we also want to check whether you know the, the, the Congress uh, passed the bill that said, uh, passed the act that said, okay, this is how, uh, Premium should change, but did the government, did the National Flood Insurance Program actually implement those changes? And it uh, looks like it is the case. So these, in our data, these high-risk pre-map pre houses are seeing much larger increases in flood insurance premiums uh, starting from 2013. So next, we explore some heterogeneous effect so the first one we explore is whether uh, disclosure matters. And we find that in states where there's a requirement to disclose flood zone information, the effect is much larger. It becomes twice as large as uh, the other states. So that means the um, information matters and not all buyers go seek out this information when they buy houses, um, unless it's um, freely uh, provided to them. And we also uh, look at another heterogeneous effect, which is we split our sample into when the buyers are, uh, sorry, yeah. So this should be when the buyers are primary versus non-primary buyers. And we find this when an investor comes to buy a house, the effect is larger. And we think it's related to the investors being more sophisticated 
And also the law says, okay, if an investor buys a house, we actually demand higher rate increases. And that's also what we see in the data. So higher rate increases also uh, probably leads to this higher price discounts on this uh, on these uh, category of houses. So we have some alternative explanations that you may be thinking, maybe you think, well, these pre-map homes are potentially more exposed to certain risks. For example, sea level rise risk, and especially so in high risk zones. And these risks, according to some other papers, uh, began to be priced into home values around 2013. And we have some counter evidence uh, against this uh, concern. We find that with our fixed effects, the risks, uh, many, many risks related to current and future flood, flooding is similar between pre-map and post-map houses. And this, uh, this difference between pre-map and post-map houses is also similar between high and low risk zones. And so what are the risks we consider? We can see the sea level rise risk, and we also consider this first street foundation flood factor, which is touted as uh, uh, the, the best flood factor out there at, that's at the property level. And we also looked at a storm surge uh, flood uh, risk and the distance to water and uh, whether the house has a basement or not. And some other alternative, another alternative explanation is that maybe these older houses become more vulnerable to flooding, um, especially in high risk zones. So one thing we we can do is we restrict our sample to houses that were built just around map year. So if say the map year was 1975, then we look at houses built in between 1973 and 1977. And our effects, uh, uh, our our results are still robust to this. And another concern people have is, well, older houses are more likely to have basements, so maybe this is driving it. So in this, uh, in the third column, we introduce a new triple interaction term, basically kind of replacing this pre-map with this uh, basement dummy, and we find that this new interaction term did not take away our main effect. So our main results are pre still pretty robust. And this triple interaction term is also not getting any significance here. So suggesting that it's not because these pre-map houses are getting are more likely to have a basement that's leading to our result. And another alternative explanation is that maybe around 2013, the expected flood frequency, all the severeness increased more for high risk than low risk zones. And pre-map houses are for some reason just more vulnerable. So what we do here is we restrict uh, our sample to houses only near the borders between high risk and low risk zones. So if you think, well, there's a huge difference between high risk houses and low risk houses, by restricting to the houses near the border, we're shrinking the difference between these, uh, these two zones. Uh, and we find our effects are still uh, robust, even when we shrink the, the distance to the boundary to all the way down to 250 feet. So another, uh, so let me just skip this uh, alternative explanation in the interest of time. And another question we want to ask is, does the rate change cause people to update expectations of costs associated with future or current flood risk? What, what, what were we thinking of uh, when we talk about future flood risk? So we're thinking about sea level rise risk and that will manifest uh, in let's say 80 or 100 years from now. So we interact our triple interaction term with the sea level rise dummy so this this dummy variable turns to one if we if a house uh, is is exposed to sea level rise at six feet. So these risks will not uh, materialize until maybe eighty years later. And we find that the effect is stronger for houses that are exposed to sea level rise risk. And then we also consider some current flood risk. For example, this first street flood uh, foundation, first street foundation flood factor measures flood risk within the next 30 years. 
And we do not find that uh, risks being stronger for houses that are more likely to flood in the short term. And we also use some other measures, for example, storm surge and distance to water and uh, there being more than three big floods in, uh, in the past. And all of these other quadruple interaction terms did not become statistically significant, suggesting that people are not updating these short-term risk, current flood risk, potential because people understand these risks better, these short-term risks, and these short-term risks have already been incorporated in home prices today. So this are uh, some um, examples of what we mean by sea level rise risk. So here we're looking at Chesapeake County, which is not by the water, uh, not by the ocean, but a lot of the houses are still exposed to sea level rise risk. So this dark, uh, dark blue is the uh, is the water, and the light blue are houses that are exposed to sea level rise risk at six feet. And our measure of sea level rise risk is at property level. So some property, let's say this property C and B, they are pretty close to each other, and B is actually at lower elevation than C. However, C is going to be exposed to sea level rise because uh, there are some higher higher grounds between B and the water. So these are granular measures. Uh, let me let me talk about this. Uh, one thing we are curious is we want to know how much house price change uh, when premiums go up by one dollar. So we kind of want to know the elasticity of this pass through effect. And we split our sample into houses that are not exposed to sea level rise risk and houses that are exposed. So for houses that are exposed, now we change our dependent variable to house price in thousands of dollars. And we find on average house prices go down for these high risk premium houses uh, by more than $5,000. And their premiums increase by around $132. So this, with these numbers, we can back out kind of um, the, the, the elasticity, if, if you let me. So when premiums go up by $1, home prices go down by $41. And if we think the home prices, uh, the home prices reflect only cash flow effects from the premium increase, and the premiums are not gonna change more in the future, then that in, uh, that gives us a discount rate of 2.5%. So this is very similar to the 2.6% in uh, uh, Gigolo et al. paper. And when we turn to the houses that, that are exposed to sea level rise risk, we see much larger effect on home prices, even though the premium increase is actually a little bit smaller in the sample period that we, we observe. So this interprets to a much larger magnitude. When premiums go up by $1, home prices go down by $250. So this magnitude is seem really big. How do we rationalize it? On one hand, we think when uh, people are updating, people may be just updating the expectation of future premiums. And we, th we kind of back out how much people may be expecting the future premiums to increase and uh, this magnitude of $700 of increase of this pre-map relative to post-map homes, this is not unreasonable, we think. And it's also possible that people are updating the, the perception of risk. They may think uh, when premiums are going up, people are more likely to assess the coverage. They think, well, premiums are going up. Do I really need as much coverage as I used to get? And now they are thinking of uh, reevaluating the risks that they actually face. And that may cause them to update the perception of risk. And they actually think, well, my risk is, this, the risk of these houses are pretty high. So the value of those houses actually go down. And this could also be consistent with the idea of a saline shock. When premiums go up and people get the saline shock and they go refile their uh, risks and realize their risks are actually higher than they thought. Uh, so another thing we want to test is whether 
people's opinion towards climate change matters. So climate change believers may have higher expectations of future flood insurance rates if there are no subsidy uh, compared to non-believers because climate change believers may think, well, in the future, there's going to be a lot more floods and as subsidies will phase out for these pre-map high-risk homes, these climate change believers will make larger updates on the expected premiums for these homes than non-believers. And the uh, flood insurance premium effect should be larger in places where more people believe in climate change. So we use the Yale Climate uh, Opinion Survey at county level, and we classify counties as um, more worried, these uh, warmer colors, more worried if they have uh, a percentage of people, adults who are worried about global warming higher than the medium and the other counties is less worried. So here we find that in the uh, more worried counties, we get larger effect both as a baseline, as well as uh, for the houses that are exposed to sea level rise. So this is consistent with our prediction earlier. And we also try to evaluate whether people do any mitigation. And mitigation data is really hard to come by. We went through uh, a lot of building permits data and the, the, uh, the, the permits that related to climate change uh, or flood mitigation is just really, really rare. And then we turn to rebuilding activity. We think, oh, it's possible when uh, premiums go up, people may rebuild more. One way this may happen is that by rebuilding to a higher elevation, they could people can lower their premiums, like I taught I, I mentioned earlier. And another reason may be that people want to increase the flood resilience of their house and decrease damage as they decrease their coverage when premiums become more expensive. And we look at the entire sample, we don't really see much. Uh, we don't really see high-risk pre-map houses changing their um, rebuilding activities very much. And we look at houses that are not exposed to sea level rise. And again, if anything, the activities actually go down. But for the houses that are exposed to sea level rise, we do see uh, a weak increase in their rebuilding activity. And this could be because our data is too noisy, we can't really pin down, uh, pin down this rebuilding activity. But it could also be that these price impacts that we talked about earlier, even for the houses that are exposed to sea level rise, it's uh, 20 something thousand dollars, it may not justify uh, the very costly rebuilding. So this, uh, Flood insurance rate change may not have enough incentive financially to cause house, households to rebuild the houses to mitigate risks. And we also look at whether there is any effect on transaction probability on, on the liquidity of houses that are affected. So here we have a house, whether houses is being transacted on the left-hand side and our triple interaction terms on the right-hand side. And we see a, uh, a small decrease in 2014 in terms of uh, transaction probability. That could be because there's a lot of policy uncertainty. People didn't know whether there was going to be a further law change changes that affect uh, flood insurance rates until the second act was passed in 2014. And then the rates, uh, the, the transaction probability picked it back up again. Okay, so let me conclude. In this paper, we find that when flood insurance premiums go up, that leads to a decrease in home prices. And we find that effect is larger in states that mandate uh, flood insurance disclosure and for homes that are exposed to sea level rise risk. And as climate change worsens, the cost of insuring against physical risk can decrease asset value if these assets are exposed to uh, uh, exposed to these climate related risks. And we also think our paper has implications on flood insurance rate setting, as well as private uh, insurance rate setting uh, regulation, for example, uh, wildfire and other homeowners insurance rates. 
And when the weights are set too low, we think home values could be inflated and not really reflect the risks and the costs associated with uh, ensuring those risks um, for those homes. And more importantly, we think our paper highlight a channel uh, that is insurance uh, set, rate setting through which loan run climate risk can be incorporated into home values today. Hey, thank you. I look forward to the discussion. Well, great. Thank you so much, Sean, uh, for a very uh, interesting and very clear presentation. So let's open up for questions. Um, if you have a question, please feel free to post it in the Q&A window and uh, I will I, I will post those questions to Shan. So we already have a few Shan and so if you don't want getting started. So Yehuda Klein asks actually two questions. Um, so first question is if a homeowner elevates his house above, sea, uh, above, above the flood level, how are rates affected? Um, and especially how are rates also affected by houses that have been repeatedly flooded? Okay, so the first, uh, the first, let me first answer the first question. If homeless elevates their house, then uh, they will get a lower premium. And the second question, if a house had been repeatedly flooded, yes, their premiums would go up. And the law, the law change also said their premiums will go up by more. And in our, data we um, cannot as can, we don't have a house level data on whether a house is flooded or not so we can't really explore this heterogeneity uh, in our tests great um then Stephen asks um, a normative question do we have people rebuilding in houses in flood plains and near the coast um, isn't flood insurance that provides resources for such rebuilding socially wasteful? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. That's kind of beyond uh, the scope of our paper, but I think the policy design could potentially incentive, give people actual incentive to move away from their home, but people potentially attach a lot of uh, non-monetary value to their home and where they live. And it's kind of really hard to answer this question in terms of welfare. Right. Um, yeah, and he has, he has one more question. Um, one second, sorry guys. Um, yeah, so he has one more question on um, the insurance gap the idea that um, insurance speeds rebuilding so it can have a first order effect on growth. So could you comment on that idea? Yeah, that's a great point. I think there is a, there is a paper on, uh, there are probably more than one paper on this, but I know at least for a household level, the insurance, uh, when they do have flood insurance, the households actually recover much better. And interestingly, wealthier households, the poor households are actually more likely to not have insurance and end up being even worse off. Uh, but that's not based on my research. I think it's Emily uh, Gallinger's paper and co-authors. Great, thanks, Sean. Um, so Mike uh, has, has, has another question for you. Um, so he's saying he's under the impression that for ma major federal em emergencies declared events, the federal government essentially bails out households that are flooded um, or allow them to at least retroactively apply for coverage. So do you know if how much of this is taking place and how problematic that may be for your estimates? Yeah, I actually am not aware that they can retroactively apply for coverage, uh, but that's something I should check. And yes, households do get bailed out. Um, so I guess that can affect take up. So people may not buy flood insurance voluntarily when they should be buying. And that's uh, something we have seen with the most recent hurricane in Florida. Uh, more than one third of the house is actually not insured while they should be. 
so I guess um, it probably under it probably causes our estimates to be more conservative, if that's the right word. Uh, compared to a world where people are all buying flood insurance and there's no government bailout. Because in when we do our estimates, we don't really know whether the ho a house has flood insurance or not. We cannot match our flood insurance data with our household data. And, uh, and I guess when people just don't plan to buy flood insurance, then our effects are probably more limited. Great. Um, so there's one more question on the insurance coverage cap of the $250,000 limit. Um, do you know how that might affect the responses? And do you see like heterogeneity in effects across like- Yeah, and yeah, that's a great point. So that's something we're trying to explore right now. The $250,000 coverage, uh, coverage cap is for the building of the uh, for the building itself, repairing the building, and that's called something called replace replacement value. So, if a house is uh, three million dollars, but it's in a great location, maybe the replacement replace uh, replacement value of the house is still much lower than the cap. So, we can't really test this. Um, you know, how different houses react differently depending on how expensive it is to, to replace the house. So right now we are, um, we have applied fully a, a release of this replacement value of the houses. FEMA actually collects that for the houses that are in the insurance data set. So it will be really interesting to test out how the price effects are different for houses that are below this cap and houses above this cap. And that can also help us tease out whether, you know, there's effect coming through just uh, cash flow or it's also coming through uh, updated risk expectation. Because if it's just about cash flow, we would think the effect should be, you know, not increasing once the replacement value goes beyond 250,000 as the house values becomes more expensive. But we're still waiting on that data. Okay. Um, while we're waiting for a few questions, let me ask one of mine, uh, Sean. Um, so do you have a sense if, if the maps, the up, map updates that happen, they have, if they happen after a big disaster, so are they kind of tend to be correlated with climate shocks? Um, that could be the case. So we actually don't have all the map updates. We only have one digital map that we're using. So that's a 2018 digital map. And we, for some reason, the old FEMA wouldn't give us the old digital maps. They just said they are not available. Apparently they had them in the past. So our, our high risk versus low risk measure is also noisy for that reason. And with this noise in our X variable, it's potentially probably biasing our results towards zero. But yeah, it is an interesting question whether map updates after disasters. And I, I think they probably do. Right, and um, one more question I had. You showed this table at the, at the beginning uh, on um, the price increase uh, for the different categories of um, um, in, the, in the data. So do you have a sense of what happens before 2012? Like, do you have an increase in prices that kind of mirror what you have post 2012, or is the increase, the rate of increase is much slower up until 2012? Yeah, so we have, a, we do have the older data and we have that in the, so what matters to us is whether this, uh, I guess I don't even know whether it matters to us, but we had this graph, how price uh, premiums changed for pre-map relative to, uh, sorry, pre-map high-risk homes relative to other homes. And that increase is, there is a little bit increase, but it's much, much milder. And we think it's not because, you know, people are anticipating this law change or FEMA was, mm -hmm. was implementing some changes. This is, their, their rates are kind of idiosyncratic from year to year, how they change the rates. I see, okay. Okay, uh, Mike has one more question for you. So he's asking uh, about, the sea level rise variable that you're using. So when you're saying you're exposed to sea level rise, what exactly uh, is this capturing? So is this a measure of 
inundated at a certain sea level rise increase or based on some scientific projections, are you able to explore any variation related to this, this exposure measure? Yeah, so this exposure measure we use is just the dummy variable of zero or, uh, zero or one if a house is uh, gonna be inundated when sea level rises by six feet. And uh, we could explore measures such as, we can also get the three feet measure and some other uh, climate scenarios. And that'll be interesting to explore the, the uh, variation. Yeah, the projections we're using are just those from NOAA. All right. Um, so this is one more question on the institutional background, uh, Sean. Um, so Stephen's asking um, exactly how you use the insurance uh, compensation that you get from the NFIP. So do you get compensation only for the structure or, or the land? And can you use this money to actually rebuild elsewhere? You get the compensation for the structure. So basically, I think the assumption is that the land cannot be damaged and it's only the structure that will be damaged. So you get a compensated for repairing the structure. And I don't think if you rebuild elsewhere, you can, you will get compensated. And I think if you would build, uh, it's it's different from FEMA disaster loans. I think now FEMA disaster loans, um, I think, allow you to rebuild elsewhere. Right. Um, if there's any more questions, feel free to post them on the on the Q and A. We still have a few minutes. Okay, um, Sean, uh, let me ask you one more. <laughs> so th th these are great data. So on, on the house transactions, did you did you get a sense if some of these old houses, these old houses, the transactions are like, I, I'm guessing like are fairly illiquid. So do you, do you observe these transaction prices uh, with as much frequency as you do for like some of the newer houses? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Uh... Let me see. So we actually did test that. Um, I guess we normalized it all to zero, the effect to zero before the reform. So I don't have the raw numbers to say whether the older houses are more illiquid. Yeah, that's a great question. I should I should check on that. But to the extent we only use the transaction prices, I, you know, I. I don't know whether yet. Yeah, so the prices could have the illiquidity component, illiquidity component, and we tested our through our sample period whether there is a change um, to the illiquidity of these treated homes, and we also only found a lower illiquidity during 2013 and 2014. And for our price results, we also did a robustness test where we excluded those two years and found still very similar effects. So we think uh, our results are potentially not driven by a decrease of liquidity for these houses, for these treated homes. And then obviously the, you've got the time diff as well. So something has to change in 2013. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Okay. Um... Let me see if there are more questions. No, um, I guess, and we're, we're nearly out of time as well. So, so let's all of us thank Sean uh, for um, an excellent presentation. Um, and thank you everyone for joining the session today. Um, we're also looking forward to more webinars um, in uh, starting in the fall. And um, so it would be great uh, if you could continue the engagement and join us for, for our series in the future. Um, I also wanted to actually bring your attention to the e-access forums annual research prize. Um, it recognizes research con conducted by young scholars in macroeconomic policies and sustainability 
And this year's topic is financing the green transition. So if you want to learn more about that, uh, there's more information available at the website. Okay, so with that, thank you everyone for, for joining the session today and um, have a great rest of the day. Thank you, everyone.